Great, thank you very much. Uh, so the second one uh, is also related to all of the things we've been talking about, and, and I imagine you'll you'll see some some areas of synergy and some areas of overlap, and, and we'd love for you for you to warn us of the of the latter and encourage the former. Um, so this is an effort to uh, um, basically unify the many efforts ongoing currently to identify potentially actionable uh, genetic variants. I'll explain what uh, what we mean by that. Um, we recognize that genomic studies with a variety of technologies are increasingly identifying variants that have potential implications for clinical care, whether they have real implications or not is was what the previous discussion was about. Um, these really seem to be unavoidable in genomic scale research, certainly in genome-wide uh, association studies. Chromosomal anomalies, you know, sort of hit you in the face. You can't miss them, um, and, and we need to come up with a way of dealing with those, which I, I think we've done initially, but uh, much more is, is needed. Direct-to-consumer testing, patients bring this stuff in, and, and clinicians are then challenged, either they ignore it completely or they find ways to, to potentially use it. Um, and sequencing for clinical care is, is, as Rick and others have pointed out, going to be generating even more um, variants that people don't quite know what to do with. Um, it's also fairly clear that as we, we try to move toward implementation, evaluation, and then effective implementation, uh, we do need some paradigm-setting examples. So, so when you raise this with clinicians, a lot of times their first response is, this is 3 billion base pairs, I can't deal with, you know, with, with three medicines, let alone that, that size of a data set. And, and really, if we can sort of pull out a couple of examples, set some paradigms that will help drive some of the ethical deliberations. Is CYP2C19 in, in clopidogrel, is that really, a, you know, a good example? Can we debate the pros and cons of that and really take some of those um, um, perhaps more straightforward, and nothing is straightforward once you get into it, and also develop some of the infrastructure uh, for, for actually doing this in the clinic, as, uh, as um, uh, Jill had, had mentioned. Um, there have been efforts to, to try to do this, or at least recognizing the need to, to do this sort of thing for many years. The, the first um, call I've seen in, in print actually comes from my colleague Ebony Bookman, a uh, conference report from an NHLBI working group about, let's see, 2004, so, so now nearly eight years ago, um, that noted that when genetic results are under consideration for reporting, there should be some standard criteria and guidelines uh, developed and followed. Uh, to our knowledge, this has, has not been done in large part, although this report proposed some. Um, and a list of genetic tests that meet these criteria should be reviewed to identify those uh, appropriate to consider for reporting. Uh, NHLBI updated this report uh, just recently with another working group that Amy was a, a second author on there with Rich Fabs. It's uh, recommending as its third recommendation an independent National Central Advisory Committee be established to review evidence for genetic risk factors and offer guidance to investigators, institutions, IRBs regarding when a result is well enough understood um, to justify an obligation to return results. Obligation is, is another one of those difficult words, um, and, and perhaps we, we may not be able to go quite so far as identifying those in which one is, is obliged, because those are, are all situations that depend so much on, on local settings, clinical settings, and, and other things. Uh, you heard Eric describe a number of related workshops that have, have led to this, uh, genetics and health information technology that was uh, organized by our colleague Greg Furo in, in April, um, uh, identified a need for this sort of thing, um, the colloquium called for it, uh, the IOM workshop on integrating large-scale genomic information uh, called for it as well. Um, NHLBI had a workshop, uh, a follow-up one in August of 2011 looking at integration and display of genetic results in EHRs, came up with some very good recommendations for how one might go about doing that. Obviously, the, uh, the second genomic medicine meeting in December. And we also held a December meeting that Howard was, uh, was kind enough to come to in his new home in Bethesda um, to, to address um, uh, the processes, databases, and other resources that might be needed to identify clinically relevant variants, decide whether they are actionable and what that action should be, and provide them for consideration for clinical use. So, so not necessarily that they be used, but at least that, that we narrow the universe a bit of, of those that should be considered. Now, there, is, there are many awkward words in, in this. One of them is this term actionable. Um, many of you have heard of, of the terms clinical utility, clinical validity, and, and uh, a lot of times we get the question, well, isn't this actionability really clinical utility and why not just stick with that term? This reminds me of the, uh, you know, taste great, less filling debates of the 1970s. Uh, in, in some ways it, it may just be um, terminology, but it may be a little bit more than that. 
So the, the best definition I could find of clinical utility uh, from, from the, the gentleman who invented it, uh, Muin Curry, um, is in the EGAP rep uh, report methods paper in 2009 that is evidence of improved measurable clinical outcomes and usefulness of a genetic test and added value to patient management uh, decision making. Uh, so typically what, what most are expecting with a, a variant that has clinical utility is that there is a net and real uh, benefit to a patient uh, from its use over not using it. Um, in general, this, these kinds of things then must meet a very high evidentiary bar, and in some specialties that's expected to be a, you know, a full randomized clinical trial, which may not be um, either, either um, um, practical nor necessary for, for all variants and all decisions to be made. Perspectives differ widely on the importance of the clinical nature of the outcomes. So um, in the, some of these sequencing programs, particularly uh, uh, those that uh, um, Harvard is running and, and the Medical College of Wisconsin, also in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, there's been a tremendous benefit to patients in ending the diagnostic odyssey. Even if you can't find, uh, I mean, if you can't do anything about it, at least knowing that there is something that is, uh, that is wrong and, and, uh, and having a name to it is, is something that, that helps tremendously making reproductive uh, decisions, other things. Some clinicians may not consider that to be a clinical outcome. Um, patients uh, may well. It also, I should note, uh, varies by context. So some of these variants um, may be very important in, in advanced ages, in people at, at particular risks with particular exposures or a given family history, um, may be very unimportant or unclear uh, how important they are in a child, for instance, or someone without those risk factors. <coughs> Thresholds may need some tailoring to cost, burden, and risk of the proposed intervention. If one considers the information just to be another piece of information a clinician may use in making difficult decisions about a patient, uh, one can argue, and, and we've heard it argued, that isn't more information better? It isn't always. On the other hand, if, if you're not talking about a, a dramatically um, uh, um, invasive intervention, such as when you're on a long plane flight, be sure you get up and walk around even if the marshals want to put you back in your seat. Um, that may be a useful thing. And, and something that may not require quite as much evidence as, as something else. Recognizing that ad addressing nuances like this requires very careful, considerate, and really local deliberation. These are local uh, issues. And Gail Jarvik likes to um, uh, quote Tip O'Neill about all politics is local. Similarly, all genetics is local. <coughs> and, and making these needs to be done at the level of, of the institution. Uh, but that can be informed by expert consensus. So what we mean by actionable, um, and we'd, we'd welcome your input on, on this, is evidence that's not sufficient for unequivocal clinical utility, but is sufficient to determine how some already available information could be used in a clinical context. Someone else may need to decide should it be used, and ultimately that will be a decision at the level of an institution or a clinician or a patient. Um, but it may be an intermediate stage between sort of clinical validity and clinical utility, sort of asking the question, if you had this information, would you use it and how would you use it? It may allow considerations of the ethics, law, and policy in the whole return of results arena to really sort of be shifted a bit to the appropriate expertise. It's not clear that clinicians and institutions have the expertise to be able to make these decisions. There needs to be um, those with expertise in, in that area making those decisions. If there's a way of, of at least separating them out a little bit, perhaps work can proceed in parallel. And just like the, the children's book, The Big Jump, you know, if you go in, in little steps, you may do a little bit better um, than trying to tackle it all at once. And it does allow for more flexibility for <coughs> clinicians and institutions to tailor the use of variant information to a given patient patient, a given clinical setting, and local standards of practice. So we see this as sort of a, a, a complex matrix of making decisions. The, the first issue that one needs to address is what is related to clinical outcomes. Um, and we see that as, as genotype, phenotype data resources, which CSER is certainly going to, to generate, but there are others, uh, NCBI's ClinVar, the EGAP process, uh, our GWAS catalog, the ISCA process, the PharmGKB, a whole variety of, of discovery and, and uh, association databases that this resource would, would definitely not do. There's also the question of what should be done. Um, the Return of Results Consortium and, and efforts like it would sort of land on, on this side of the equation, um, which is there currently and similar uh, programs are doing empirical, uh, behavioral and social sciences research, normative research in determining what, what we really uh, believe is the right thing to do here. Um, Caesar, the CSER uh, uh, subprojects are, are addressing ethical and psychosocial issues. And so we really are trying to address here the, the question, what could be done? What, what are the options that are available and, and that should be evaluated? And that would be more where ClinAction would sit. But all of these would need to provide information to clinicians, institutions, IRBs, <coughs> payers, and don't forget the patients. Uh, in order to, to actually decide what will be done with, with given information. 
Uh, it's also very important, as we've heard previously, to ensure coordination with related efforts. Um, there are a variety of these. Probably the, uh, the, the oldest and best is the, uh, which isn't very old, is the PGRN's um, uh, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, which is doing this basically drug gene pair by drug gene pair for um, pharmacogenetic variants. And we would hope that we could learn from that process, model on it uh, where, where appropriate, um, and, and uh, absorb the, the um, um, knowledge that has been gained there uh, into ClinAction. Uh, there's also the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory uh, Research, EMERGE. The EMERGE program is, is has already uh, started to identify actionable variants because we're faced with them in, in genotyping studies. Uh, we would expect EGAP would, would also have uh, important information to provide, as would the FDA. The FDA has a, a website with over 100 uh, variants listed um, that are, are related to, pharmaco uh, the, to response to, to various drugs. Uh, and that's a, another place. Plus, there are other groups that are doing this. So the Coriel Personalized Medicine Consortium actually has probably been doing this since before uh, the, the PGRN has. Um, that, that group has a uh, uh, an entire group set aside that, that is just looking at actionable variants. The Vanderbilt uh, group is doing this as well. And in fact, as we heard in talking with the various genomic medicine centers in the colloquium, every one of them is doing this kind of thing. For the most part, with the same handful of variants, looking at the same evidence, coming largely to the same conclusions about the evidence that's available, but deciding differently in terms of, of how and when to implement. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a way to actually bring those together? And recognizing that they, they all still exist and need to exist, can we then build on them, feed back um, uh, some of the, the uh, knowledge that we've gained uh, from, from those efforts and, and so that they can um, you know, basically not have to duplicate what each of them is doing? So the proposal here is to support identification and dissemination of consensus information on potentially actionable genetic variants in clinical care, the goals being to identify variants with implications for clinical care, collect the evidence, and disseminate it so that people could make decisions on their own with the evidence at hand rather than having to send a graduate student, as is currently done, to, to pull all the evidence that's available. Develop clinical decision support systems for incorporating these variants into clinical care, build upon existing programs, unify, and hopefully reduce duplicative efforts across numerous uh, research and clinical organizations. The scope we would anticipate would be a single awardee to collect and evaluate the clinical relevance of variants associated with clinically important traits, and obviously all of those would need to be defined. This is just a concept at this level. Um, we would anticipate a multi-component approach, which would include synthesis and curation of, of the data, consensus development and integration with ongoing efforts, and dissemination. Probably the toughest of these is going to be the second, the consensus development and integration with ongoing efforts. It would be important to recognize that, that this group would likely not, um, and I don't think we would be in a position at NHGRI to support providing screening recommendations, but rather providing the evidence on which those recommendations could be made. And NHGRI is in a, a relatively good position um, from an NIH standpoint because we are not disease specific. Um, so, so we can address these across a variety of, of diseases and, and a variety of institutes, many of whom, I can tell you, are thrilled that NHGRI is willing to try to tackle this problem and are, are eager to collaborate. The question also is not whether sh clinicians should be advised to order a particular assay, but again, what should or could be considered if a patient's results were already available, recognizing that this is happening in every clinic or will happen soon in every clinic, but certainly is, is coming um, and something that we need to be prepared for. So the con consensus development and integration process could work by uh, inviting existing groups that are already doing this kind of work to join uh, or to interact at least with the, with the, uh, the Clean Action resource, developing a framework for review and evaluation. So gathering from all of these different groups that are doing this, how do you go about doing it? What evidence do you collect? How do you go about collecting it? And really kind of codifying that, not in a, in a, in a conc uh, concretizing way, but in, in a way that keeps others from having to, you know, basically reinvent the wheel perhaps defining domains to group the variants for, for evaluation. So wouldn't it be really cool if we could divide up some of these and not everybody has to look at CYP2C19, uh, but some could look at, at uh, one, uh, variants in one area and some in another. Applying that review framework then and reaching consensus, if you can, on variants and actions to be recommended. Um, and I, obviously, you know, choosing people to be part of this that, that are consensus builders rather than, um, than perhaps the opposite, but recognizing that sometimes deliberations can't be brought to a consensus, and hopefully there would be a, a rare inability to do so, but it would be important to address that and to make it clear when there was not a consensus and why not. 
um, obtaining input from uh, a variety of stakeholders, payers, professional organizations, clinicians, patients on the draft recommendations, and ensuring consistency of domain-specific recommendations with the framework. So if we set out a framework, the criteria and, and guidance that uh, uh, NHLBI called for many years ago, uh, making sure that, that at least to some degree um, the deliberations are consistent with that and, and consistent across. One could also consider these different groups um, as perhaps taking a, a given area. So it might make perfect sense for the PGRN to continue to focus on pharmacogenetic variants. Maybe there'd be some group that just wanted to take the GI variants, for example. They had a, a GI clinic that was really interested in that because they had a, a champion in that area. Or maybe the ophthalmologist or the rheumatologist or, or the orthopedists. Um, maybe one group would just want to take a single disease rather than an entire subspecialty. Or they might want to cut the pie in different ways. Just look at, at uh, those that are important in Asian Pacific Islanders or just those that are important in Hispanic Latinos or just those that are important in the military, whatever it might be, um, there could conceivably be a way of, of dividing up this work rather than duplicating it. Um, the dissemination and clinical decision support um, would, you know, seems much more straightforward after, uh, after considering the consensus, but this is a challenging area as well. Um, it would be important to provide supporting evidence and documentation of the consensus process, um, and then to develop and distribute uh, clinical decision support rules, which would be uh, kind of a description of what one would do in CDS without having specific software programs or the tools that would be actually the, the uh, specific um, software for adoption in the EMRs and other clinical systems. Um, be great if we could find some user-friendly tools for clinicians without access to such systems and distribute them to other health systems, especially non-U.S. systems. Uh, you may recall that Eric noted uh, that the workshop we held on this was uh, co-sponsored by the Wellcome Trust. They're very interested in this area as well. Uh, their medical records are quite different from ours, as is their medical system. Anticipated funding would be $2 million uh, in fiscal 13 as, a, as sort of a startup, and then we would anticipate $4 million per year for the, for the following three years. Uh, we would hope that two to three domains plus the, the defining the framework structure could be um, um, uh, tackled in the first year, and then perhaps five to eight domains, domains annually after that. Um, when we would consider a continuation if uh, there was effective development and if the um, uh, resource was increasingly used. Might consider that, reconsider that at three to five years. Uh, this would use cooperative agreement, and again, we would su uh, seek support and, and uh, enthusiasm from other ICs. Uh, and again, uh, thanks to the, uh, uh, those who, who participated in the workshop um, and the workshop planning group, particularly Rex and Mark, who co-chaired it, and especially Aaron Ramos, who has done much of the work on this and uh, who, who would uh, be presenting this were it not for an initiative of her own that she's been busy with. So uh, who, who happens to be in the back? Yes. Holding <laughs> so, her initiative. Uh, holding her initiative. So you have to bring Logan around and let everybody see him. So I think with, uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. This may be a little off topic, but as you get towards consensus around specific variants, I mean, are malpractice lawyers going to be drooling at this? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, if it's clinical care, you get sued for not doing it. If it's mm -hmm. research, you get sued for doing it. Yeah. No, that's and a, my fear frothing. is we already, frothing. what? Be frothing. frothing. Okay, <laughs> drooling, whatever. <laughs> Something will be coming out of their mouth. Uh, yeah, no. that's right. Yeah. No, ex I think excellent they drool point. Too. Uh, yeah, they do. They do all of that, and and one of the big barriers is that um, uh, clinicians are saying, "I don't want to have these results in the medical record because then I have to work on, that. you know, I have to act on them." So one of the things that's been discussed, and, I, and again, Howard and Rex and, and Jim, those of you who are, are doing this kind of work, is we will only pull out a few of those variants. So we'll, we'll keep the results in some intermediate database, and the clinical decision support will only pull out those things that we all agree are are relevant and appropriate. So the clinician may never see the 5. 100,000 other results, but they will see the variant that all of the at the institution and others have agreed is, is one that's worth acting on. Would that uh, address that concern? I mean, you also went through how this is local. You know, you mm -hmm. said everything is local. I mean, right. you know, we all know if you have a sodium of 150, you should do something. Right. Um, but, you know, if you have this variant, right. where you know, well, where does that filter out? No, that's a, it's a good point. And, and I think one of the challenges here is going to be institutions figuring out what, where they have flexibility to implement something or where the evidence is so strong, and, and Howard can say this better than I, that, that they don't have a choice and they need to, to pursue it. I, I'm not sure I can say it better than you, but we already have that situation with the FDA package insert changes. And I think many of us are getting calls by litigation attorneys saying, hey, we have Asian patients who got carbamazepine, got Stevens-Johnson syndrome, 
you know, package insert was changed three years ago, let's go. Uh, so that, that sort of thing's already out there in a way, with pharmacogenetics being a, a I wouldn't say a driver of litigation, but a component of, of that. So in, in some ways, this might bring some clarity to that. I, I, I hope that it will remain visible to the people we want it to see and visible to others, but you know what reality is like. Yeah, yes, Jim. Yeah, I think, Pearl, your point is actually a, a very important driver of this. I, this, I think, is a very important initiative because it cuts across the entire range of communities that are, that are concerned with whole exome, whole genome sequencing, whether you're doing research, whether you're doing clinical, whether you're concerned with the, the legal aspects. There has to be some kind of central guidance about the things that should be considered. And, and I think you're right to bring up the term, like you did on one of your slides, obliged. And it's not that it, it, this, I'm sure, would be promulgated as here's the final you know, end all and be all list that everybody's obligated to do. But it will inform the responsibilities that everybody has doing this. And it'll make their lives easier if it's done right, right? Because the, all the local groups can st use that as a starting point. Great. Uh, Rex and then Mike. Yeah, and, and I, I think you might just think of this in the same way you think of uh, how uh, clinical standards recommendations get made uh, all along. Uh, they, they're typically made by domain experts. The domain experts publish them. And then what happens is at each local site, there's a clinical implementation or quality improvement or TNP group that reviews them and decides whether or not they're going to actually want to include them in their uh, clinical practice guidelines at that local site. And so ultimately, it's been through a variety of levels of expert uh, clinical decision making. And I think the key for us to think about is that this is simply, um, and I'm understating what Terry has laid out for you, but sort of a, a database in which that kind of information can be held and disseminated, and then local places can filter it however they want to. Exactly. Mike? So I have two very naive questions, because this is sort of far from what I do. But I guess one is, how many actionable variants do we think there are right now? And two, um, will whatever group this is be viewed in the field as having sufficient standing that all these different groups who are doing this will actually pay attention to what this group says? Yeah, um, good points. The, the first, you know, there, there are debates, and I've heard this debated. Howard, you probably have a larger number than, than I do. I mean, somewhere less than a dozen is, is what I have heard, but I don't, would you uh, care to opine? Well, with the, with the pharmacogenetic the, stuff, yep. for the, about a dozen for the things that you would act on right now. For at the public health level, we have a little bit larger number because there you're choosing amongst a, a menu of available drugs for a population. So it's a little bit different question. But then you would include some disease aspect, and so then the numbers could really go up quite dramatically if you include some of the inherited, inherited metabolic disease and other things like that where there's, there's sufficient data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can give you an ab a, a precise number. <laughs> um, so, so in going through um, OMIM and looking at every gene, our group came up with 161 candidates where there seemed to be reasonable evidence that, that knowledge of this would trigger specific recommendations. Now, 161 genes, okay, now, you're right, and this is gene-based, and that's an important point. The reason to start with genes is genes are finite, whereas variants are, are infinite, right? Um, now, many of those collapse into the same condition, all right? So, for example, um, there are many of those that predispose to, say, aneurysms, where there's clear recommendations that, you know, you should get echoes, et cetera. Um, so I'm not by any means, by coming up with a number, I mean, I do that a bit tongue-in-cheek, um, trying to say, oh, you know, end of story, so you don't need this, right? Um, the, the point is that it's a, it's a manageable number, and then you can debate. So we had a long conference call with the University of Washington people, because I'm on their, their committee for deciding these kinds of things. And, and yeah, there was a lot of consensus, a lot of agreement for most of those. And then we, we're now, we farmed out to various people on that call. <coughs> well, let's look more closely at something like MODI, Maturity Onset Diabetes of the Young. Is that really something that you'd be kind of obligated to report or not? And, and we'll have to sort through those things. But, but it's, a, it's a tractable number of genes. So, 
I, I wonder, um, I think this is, this is a super important area, um, but given the number of groups that are currently working on this in various contexts, I wonder if this is an, it would be an RFA for a new initiative or if it should be conceptualized more as a coordination kind of effort to get the people in the room who are already working on this to kind of hash it out and say, well, we've done this and these are our methods and this is what we found and well, we've done this and these were our methods and then have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. otherwise, it seems like you're just going to have one more of many. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely, yeah. So, so that's why the goal is is really to gather those efforts together. I mean, it, it really that's the anticipation is that, is that this group would be the one that would be the convener basically and bring them together. And that's not going to be an easy thing to do. And you know, Mike's point is a very good one. Why would this group be viewed as as being the you know the body that that decides on these? And I think what we would want to do would be to contact or have them. And I, again, we may be getting a little bit into the details of what applicants would would propose in their applications, so I don't want to go too far down that path. Um, but it may make sense to, to contact the organizations that are already doing this and say, what, what is it that would take for you to be happy that this would be a consensus or a group that you could follow or, or that sort of thing? But I, you know, I, I'm afraid I can't give you specifically how any, any particular applicant would choose to address that. I agree completely, though, that, that what this is is a convening uh, function. It's, it's not just another one of these. Well, yes. But, but it's, it just seems like an odd, for sort of, yes, this is really, really important. I'd love to see this happen. I just don't see how it works as an RFA. I just, and it's, I'm just repeating what the last two questioners uh, uh, brought up. It, it seems, this is a very important initiative, but is it something where you need to ask for research applications rather than somehow facilitating? It's pretty obvious what needs to happen. You need to get people together to make decisions on the 161 or whatever the number yeah. is. Yeah, well, this, this would be a, a resource application, and we, we fund a number of resources. So, so I think, you know, from that point of view, the research aspects are, are lesser than they would be in terms of, of a, you know, a regular research grant. On, on the other hand, without this kind of glue, and this is not a huge amount of glue that we're, we're providing, our efforts are really stymied. And, and one of the things that we'd really like to do in genomic medicine is find what the obstacles are and deal with them. And, and this seems to be a way of doing that. Yes? I guess I, I don't want to just repeat the concerns, but I, I have the same one, that, that it's a gnarly set of issues that we all think are really important. And my concern is that if you call for a single grantee proposal, with a really gnarly set of issues that no one group will mm -hmm. actually be able to achieve the mm -hmm. consensus that you want because the unfunded groups will still think they have a better answer than the funded than than, than the funded group. Mm -hmm. And it just it, it's I, I'm not sure for this set of issues that a, a single awardee in a rapidly changing area where there's a diversity of opinions and the issues are viewed by everybody as incredibly important mm -hmm. is going to uh, uh, achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Yeah. No, and I, I agree. That's a it's an important consideration. We had a similar sort of situation when we were trying to define phenotypic measures for genome-wide association studies and, and other genetic studies, um, and the, the same kinds of issues came up in terms of well, who are we to tell people what the phenotype should be? And the, the Phoenix Project, which you've, you've heard about, has has actually been remarkably successful in identifying those who are most committed to a given domain, a given area, who have phenotypic measures that need to be considered and, and, and really bringing them into the conversation. And I think we would expect uh, an applicant to do the same sort of thing here. Whether this is exactly the model that would be done, because again, this is a concept and we would rely on, on applicants to propose their approach. And they may choose a, a different approach from, from the one that, that, that I've described or, or that you've described. Uh, I think if we don't get into this area, we're, we really are going to have difficulty moving any, any of it forward, and if you have suggestions that are, again, at the concept level rather than, than at, the, at the application level as to what else might be considered, that would be very helpful to have. Yes? But I think people are trying to make suggestions at the concept level and not the application level. I think they're suggesting that this concept will draw the wrong kind of application. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess, I mean, I think those these points are, are really good. Um, the, but. I guess to me the strength of this is that if it is couched very much in terms of 
trying to bring in the various efforts that are, that are now working and get their input um, and make them part of the process. Without this, what I worry about is that you've got you know, the, the University of Washington, the University of North Carolina, and you've got you know, Caesar, you've got these other things that are all gonna kind of come up with similar overlapping lists with using similar but not quite the same criteria and the field will be left with insufficient guidance. Whereas if this is done right, one could imagine, all right, well, you know, here's a reasonable template that took into account many different approaches and, and here's a list, now go to it and, and apply it locally, et cetera. I, I guess that would be my, my, my defense of this kind of idea, although your points are, are I think, really well taken. Yes, Howard? So there's a need for this. What, what I can't think of at the moment is who else would do it. So even though there are a bunch of warts on this thing, or whatever, or it's, it's gnarly, I, I always use gnarly in the context of, of surfing, but I guess it, is, it does have other meanings. Um, <laughs> right. So it, it does have that, there's no doubt, but we, somehow we need to come up with some approach to it forward. And so in the absence of another better body to do this, we need to do it, I think, is, is the way I look at it. And I, I would love for the, you know, if we had a Ministry of Health in this country, then they would have done it. We don't have one, we're stuck. So if the, if the NIH can't do it as a whole, then NHGRI can do it on behalf of the NIH and go forward. So I guess I look at it as it, there is a need. Mm -hmm. And if no one else is going to step up, then why not NHGRI? Pearl? Just for information, are any other NIH institutes doing this? for their own diseases? No, and NHLBI is very interested in seeing this be done, and as, as I've said, they've had a couple of workshops in this in this area. NCI is also very interested, NIGMS is obviously doing it in, in PGRN. Well, I, you know, they actually are paying for a fair amount of, of effort in that's, that's producing this evidence, but you can't have, I don't think we want five or six different groups doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, just, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying that NHGRI shouldn't do it, and I think we all agree it needs to be done. Uh, um, some of us are having trouble seeing how funding one group to do this is going to uh, accomplish the goals, and mm -hmm. it's for, for all the reasons we've just heard. You know. mm -hmm. So I would suggest the way to think about it is that this is the recorder. This is not necessarily the decider. They're going to take the evidence that from wherever the evidence can come from. And I think to the extent that this, or, that this RFA is a place where the evidence gets recorded for whatever is available, it will be most likely to be successful. So that anybody else can go to that resource and see what variants there are out there, what genes have been uh, identified as important in producing disease or in producing a, a successful therapeutic outcome from a drug or an adverse event for that matter. Um, and to the extent that this is simply a repository of that information, oh. and people can see what the day, well, but, oh, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, let, yeah, that pushes some buttons. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it should be thought of that way. Maybe does that, and that may help you with your, rather than well, well, a standards organization. But they, yeah, sure, that, that would be really, really great. And, uh, you know, and it brings together many uh, efforts that are ongoing. I, I was hearing, though, that this was going to, this, whoever gets funded is going to come up with the list of actionable variants. And uh, I, I'm just not hearing, uh, I just can't see how that, that latter thing is going to happen. It, 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 but it really needs to happen. How, how, should, how, how, how should it happen otherwise? Then? Uh, I, mean, I don't I'm know, like a, a conference or something. <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's yeah. a mm, glue, right? You, you, you need glue money. And, and, mm -hmm. and funding one group out of five or six who want it is not glue. It's to drive them apart. And, and, and I don't know, a, a, a conference where you can't leave until you decide. <laughs> <laughs> Amy. I, would, I mean, I strongly support the idea of a database with supporting evidence for variants that's malleable over time, that changes over time, that somebody keeps up. I think that's a, a really, really good concept for this. I agree that the stand, I mean, I don't actually think it's appropriate for NIH to set clinical standards. I think that's the role of professional societies um, to put forth what the clinical standards ought to be. And so to come up with a 
definitive list, um, I would echo Prohl's concerns about that st set standard of care that has legal implications. And I would, from a, from a con concept perspective, I would shy away from that more towards sort of a, a database of what we think of over time as clinically actionable variants and the evidence to support that as it builds or or doesn't build over time. So would you would you both be more comfortable with the idea that, that this really is a database, a data resource, rather than clinical guidelines, clinical recommendations? This is, you know, this is the universe of what you might do. Um, but it's not Jim's list of here's what we're going to implement at UNC. Is that is that fair? Yeah, to me. One, one thing that I think it sounds trivial, but I think it's a really important point is I think it's critical to not get buried in the issue of variance first, right? You, Good which point. you first have to address are what are the genes in which if you have a deleterious mutation, forgetting for a moment how you define deleterious, um, that, that it is, uh, that there's a general consensus that something is advisable that you mm -hmm. do, right? Um, that has to be the first question, and I would not, I would not conflate this with the issue of variance because that is a truly intractable problem at present. Whereas, coming up with gene lists is tractable, and I like the idea of you know this being a recording kind of um, um, type thing where where this uh, this effort could say you know here are the various lists that have been come up that have have been arrived at. Um, by using these kinds of criteria, et cetera. Right. And here's the overlap, mm -hmm. right? Thanks. Yeah, or, or the processes by which you d decide on variants, right? So, so even the genes part, Jim, is, seems like there's a lot of, or there's some room for subjectivity or, or people choosing their favorites or, yeah. Uh, and, and, and so what do you really mean by actionable. Like right. So so what what I've noticed is there's there's tremendous agreement when just informally anecdotally when when I talk about this um, on on a whole variety of genes. I think I, I've never yet run into somebody who doesn't feel like a Lynch syndrome associated gene wouldn't be on this list. Okay? On the other hand, there's there always um, are a handful of rather predictable ones that there's some some uh, debate about you're always going to have this, this debate. And it, to me, a, a, a similar effort, um, but one that has traction, has been able to have been applied to, is newborn screening, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody agrees on whether Crab A disease should be a, a candidate for newborn screener or not. But for most disorders, right, most people can agree on a core set. Um, and then states are, are free to say, well, you know, we think we should do Crab A, whatever. Um, I think this is a very similar kind of thing. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the, the problems with this, right? But I, I feel like, kind of like Howard said, somebody's got to do it, right? Somebody's got to um, step up and say, this is, uh, this is um, how we're going to or, or these, this is the list that there seems to be some agreement on, and then here are ones that seem to be close calls. And well, so, or even here is the framework. I mean, we don't even have a framework. Framework's critical. Yes. Right. Yeah. right. So I agree with you. It reminds me a little bit of the druggable targets that the, that pharma likes to have been talking about for 20 years. I don't, and and that's um, limiting. I think, to, or probably has been limiting. So one of the the questions is, I mean, I think if you do anything here that works, it's good. It doesn't have to cover every single actionable ones. But I just, that strikes, the, it, it, how do you know that a loss of function or a down regulation or something of gene, usually you know that from a mouse model or something, but I guess you also know from, already from human beings. Actually, I think, and again, this gets into the variance of, actually, I think that's fairly straightforward because what has to, one has to remember is that we're talking here about, about really incidental results. We're talking about results that bubble up when there's a low a priori, or a priori risk that that individual actually has this disease. And therefore, you set a very high bar 
for, for what kind of variant you're going to call. Because what you have to avoid at all costs in a situation like this are, are an infinite number of false positives, right? You need to minimize false positives. So you set a real high bar, and that's appropriate because they have priority probability that somebody has Lynch syndrome, right, is low. You haven't selected this person for family history or anything. Therefore, you say only either, you know, frame shift mutations or mutations that have been reported and, and confirmed to be deleterious. So, so is this really, really only for rare disease then? Am I no. understanding or, or no, it's no. not? No, no, no. This is it, actually right, for on the list that you've got to decide, and this is, you know, this is one of those ones that people argue about a little would be something like hemochromatosis, factor five Leiden, right? You got to make these calls and then, you know, I mean, one of the, maybe in this RFA, you could, you could propose that people try to generate evidence, right, that would address some of the more contentious. Candidates. Well, or it, it, this may not be big enough to be able to do that. And, and being a resource, it's likely to be the sort of thing that that, that, wouldn't, that group wouldn't do. I think what would be tremendously helpful would be for them to say, we really need more evidence on X, Y, and Z. I mean, EGAP has done that. Here's the subset that's contentious. You mm -hmm. know, the community should go at it and try to figure out what's exactly. better. And, and we can help facilitate that if we're, you know, at the table. Pearl. Pearl. Uh, one thing as I'm listening to this, we've talked a lot about going to the right side of the NHGRA diagram. Um, what we're finding is clinicians, IRBs, they want to know, what do I do? So while I think a repository of the data is very helpful to many of the people sitting around this table, I think the hue and cry is more, yeah, that's nice, but how do I read those 58 articles to come out to what do I do? So whether that is a separate activity, but I fear that just having a repository is going to push us further to the left. Yeah, and, and actually, that if you'll notice in the, in the objectives, it's also to identify the actions that could be taken. So, so it's not just, you know, here are the variants, but what are the actions that could be taken, but the should be part probably can't reside in a data resource. It probably needs to be decided at, at the level of an institution. But I think it could be is a step away from yes. just a repository. Yes. Well, um, and that's, I think we are hoping that they'll do the could be stuff. So. Yeah. so David, last word. I, I think that interface issue is a little bit of my discomfort with, uh, with, with calling for this at this time because um, Really, if you think about the slides that you presented, it's a combination of pulling together information on what is actionable. But you know, there there was also a description of trying to come up with the interface that is going to um, present that information to to user groups. And I, I just think this is a very fluid, fast-moving uh, area, and I, I'm still not convinced that. Um, a single group um, at a rapidly moving time is going to be the best mechanism to put mm -hmm. together one database and the interface that presents that uh, information to, to uh, the very disparate group of clinical applications and, and users that will probably take advantage of this kind of information over the, over the next uh, mm -hmm. five or ten years. And while I agree that something is usually better than nothing, um, I've also seen for many organism databases and other things that there's a tendency to, once something is set up, that it becomes the place where other things uh, get, get added on later and decisions made at an early stage get propagated. Mm -hmm. um, and you might not make the same decision if there was uh, a wider base of options that were presented at the stage where um, the initial structures and interfaces and mechanisms of handling it uh, might have might have been considered. So. so, so would you be more comfortable then with something that awarded? It sounds like you would to, to three or four awardees that would work collaboratively. Would would that address your concern? I, I am. Yeah, I, yes, it would. Um, I realize there's scale issues, and I, I also realize what you're trying to achieve is consensus. But I. I I just think in this area that the, a, single, a single group approach um, in a rapidly moving area, I think, is unlikely to be successful. Great. No, that, that, that's very, very helpful because we're struggling with this as well. You know, how, how do you sort of anoint one group that's going to be the, the lead and, and take this over? So, so we could recast this in terms of, of it would need to be a relatively small number of awards. We'd probably need to increase the budget 
some. Um, I don't know, we, we can look at whether we could do it within this budget. If not, we might need to bring it back to you. Does that mean we're in a position to take a vote? I think so. Well, I think what we would propose then would be a, a small number of awards, three to five, uh, to do the same work. But there would be change in the budget. Well, that's, I guess that's a question. Yeah. Would, you, would you be supportive of, uh, but we, you know, we'd need to look at, at what we can afford, basically. So, Eric, I don't know how you'd, how you'd like to proceed. Well, hopefully, and, well the option is to, not, is to wait and not do anything. So I'm, I'm hearing conflicting things, too, that this is an imperative, need to get going. Um, if we, you know, if we, maybe in perfect cast with, you know, with one, but if we wait to figure out the perfect, then. But the reality is it is being done, right? So I, I don't think waiting to try to hone this would, would undermine the fact that it's being done. The, the places that are doing whole exome, whole genome sequencing are coming up with their list. They have to. But the people that aren't those, I mean, I hear just lots of confusion. You've got to help on this. I mean, I've heard this from lots of people. You've got to help on this because it's sort of, it's the wild, wild west out there. And it's something NHR can do to, in a leadership position to try to focus attention and build some consensus. This was our attempt to do that. And we can bicker about whether it's realistic to have to be one group or you need two or three, but I'm a little worried about complete inaction. Well, that's part of the challenge is the people around this table have a backup plan. I mean, we're doing it at HR institutions, right. but it's not the people around the table that are right. calling you. Carlos, were you about to say something? Well, it, I, all I was going to say is that it, it seems that part of the award has to go towards developing a set of standards towards figuring out what are going to be the entries into the database. Similar to the GWAS database, it had to reach a certain genome-wide p-value, it had to have been replicated across populations, and I mean, in many ways we're talking about effect sizes that are bigger than what's in the GWAS catalogs, right? So it's sort of a question of agreeing on a set of standards that are going to be the community standards of what populates the database, as with every database, it's, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but at least if that's transparent, then people kind of know what goes into it. I, I, I sort of do agree with the view, though, that um, there, you shouldn't award a single. I, I don't think a single award's the way to go. I think you're you're going to end up having a lot of both companies and and uh, universities try to vie for that with a lot of potentially good ideas and. Finding a couple of those to work collaboratively on that might be the same, the best approach. Perhaps maybe if you're thinking it's so important to move forward now. Could, could you get near the microphone, Didi? I'm sorry. Have one that's the re move forward with one uh, that's the recorder and just getting all everything all together, and then wait till the next council meeting to figure out how we go about in terms of the decision making part of it. Hmm. So just. Just as a point of information, because Carlos, I think the, the GWAS database is a, is a good example. I've got it open right now. I use it all the time as um, uh, a repository of information with um, a lot of results coming in, you know, on almost a daily, daily or weekly basis. What was the process at NHGRI that led to um, the establishment of what currently exists on the web as the GWAS database? And my guess is it was not a two to four million dollars a year by one group over four or five years to, to come up with a, a mechanism to, to pull the data together. The GWAS catalog is actually an internal product of NHGRI. It's, it's led by my group and it yep. started as a table in a, in a publication um, in the JCI that, that we uh -huh. basically said, gee, it would be nice to expand this. We are not in a position to be able to do that for this area. Plus, that really wasn't controversial. That didn't need really a decision. So what we were what we were doing was gathering information. You know, people reported p-values, and we we stuck them in a table. Um, that's essentially how that worked. Now, the way it became the lead is that we stuck with it, and and others look to it now and, and say, gee, you know, this is really valuable. You keep it updated. I have two staff members who spend nearly all their time focusing entirely on on this, Lucia and, and Heather. Well, okay, so, so so a hats off to that, but mm -hmm. also. Um, I, I think the fact that it came from NHGRI <laughs> also had something to do with the, the uptake, right? Which, so, which so is why, one of the reasons we really want to move on this, because we, if we're doing it, we will get uptake. I mean, if we're funding it and we're coordinating it and we're overseeing it. But, 
but it seems like the problem is is that I mean I agree with David about how stuff gets propagated once you put it in and you say and and and, and even if you have lots of caveats that this is dynamic it's going to change we're going to learn that we shouldn't have put this one on or we're certainly going to learn ones to add right but but, but um, uh, uh, so if whatever you do, I think you have to scream that from the sure. from the treetops because people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to throw my two cents in. I mean, I think that it obviously people really want to do this, and I think it's vital. I don't think that delaying for what is it four or five months is going to make that big of a difference. That sh more thought should not be put into this. I mean, this is extremely contentious. And I don't think that even if it's funded by NHGRI, it is a single RFA, it really is going to be identified with the institution that creates it. And no matter how good they are, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to draw on the diversity of opinions and contexts that they're going to need in order to create something that is really going to be a useful product. And if delaying four or five months then pays off in a much better product, I think it's some, a risk that it would be worth taking. I was, just, I was gonna sort of ask you a question about the cry to arms and what, what people are looking for because it seems to me that um, as long as we're not couching this as creating a definitive list that substitutes clinical judgment about what to look for or scientific judgment about what, what to look for but instead sort of prioritizes mm -hmm. things to look for and then pro provides the clinical decision support which I think is the key. That's what I've heard people say we really need. Um, that piece seems a little bit less contentious to me in terms of whether one group does it or multiple groups do it, whether we do it, you know what I mean? So is that, is that, where is that clinical decision support or is it the definitive list that you're he hearing people? Both. So people who, I mean, my understanding of it, and Jim may be able to answer this better than me, but my understanding of it is, you know, people who don't have the necessary expertise say, we found this, now what do I do with it and how do I go about thinking about it, you know? A decision tree. Of, to me, the, to me, the utility of, of a list is that it gives guidance to everybody who's generating genomic data about what is it I'm, and I'll use the term that Terry used with some hesitation, what is it that I'm obligated to look for? You know, we just did whole genome sequencing on these people, and, and what are the genes that I need to look in? and report something if it meets a certain bar. That's, that is the single question that I think people are asking and what they're, why they're clamoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in terms of, of clinical decision support, it's, it, that's a, a way, usually through the electronic medical record, to, to feed information to a clinician when they need it and not before. So, so that you wouldn't have to know, for instance, about um, a CYP2C19 variant, just to go back to, to that one, unless you're going to prescribe the drugs that that, that, that gene is, is involved in metabolizing and that it has an effect on, on outcome. So, so that's providing a, a rule. Sorry. Are the, next, and I do think we need to wind this down or we're going to get into So there are NIH consensus documents that come out on a periodic basis, maybe not as dynamic as Terry had in mind, but certainly for, for you know, NCI puts them out on a regular basis for screening mainly. Um, so would would you, I mean, another option would be for you to have an RFA for groups that will help feed the engine, but that it actually comes out from an HGRI. Uh, and, I, and that may come back to, because I think David's point was that it was the fact that it was on a, an HGRI website mm -hmm. that gave it extra credibility, not the fact that you funded it. Carlos, is there a position of, from the College of Medical Geneticists and Genomicists on these issues? And if not, could and HGRI and that body and maybe ASHG put together a position paper, and once that position paper has been defined, then that would give the set of guidelines for this database. And so Mike Watson was here this morning, the executive director of ACMG. Um, there's an effort right now um, that, that some of us are involved with um, at the board of ACMG to, to begin to come up with this. I, I really like the idea that I think Howard alluded to and that, 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 that you're alluding to, Carlos, that um, having the imprimatur of NHGRI or ACMG, ASHG would be a very useful thing. Again, not in a binding way that says here's the absolute list, but here's, here's a list that's been um, formed by some type of consensus. So 
and that would be great because it would get away from this this admitted significant problem of you've got one institution that's now the, the go-to place and people aren't going to like that. Uh, Aaron, did you want to make a comment? Uh, no. I was just going to say um, the comments about the interface that you know, if we put this list together and thinking back to the GWAS catalog, how it sort of started as a table, you know, you could envision the interface that this group develops as sort of that expanded table, but we've talked with groups about ensuring, like Carla said, having standard formatting so the more sophisticated institutions can then take that through web servicing and, you know, their, their own um, clinical decision support to develop what they need that works best with their institution. So if we could just package the information in a way that works for a broad number of people, but at the same time allowing at least there to be a, a clean, simple interface for those that don't have the sophisticated EHR system or the informatics groups to build systems, they could at least come here and use you know, the information as it's displayed. Okay, let's see if we can uh, build a consensus here. Is there a consensus that it's, uh, it would be a mistake to go forward with funding one group? Is there a consensus that you want to see multiple groups multiple awards come out of this, or the possibility of multiple awards. Yeah, but I mean, isn't that tied in with the concept that either multiple awards or some, some body like <clears throat> ACMG or NHGRI, right? Is that? Well, I'm trying to decide whether we're going to vote. No, I'm trying to decide whether we're just going to take an up or down vote on the document that's before you, or you're going to make some set of recommendations and then vote on that change to the document. Is that clear? Okay. So, show of hands, all those in favor of having multiple awards associated with this, hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those opposed. Mm. A lot of abstainers, a lot of abstainers. Okay, now the abstainers, would you just vote down on this no matter what form or flavor we bring to you? I just find it very hard to see the whole package and you fit in with it to say whether it's a good idea. I mean, it so, could be multiple if more easy than something else would be inappropriate. So. so is there a motion here to defer this concept to May Council? Show of hands. Those in favor? Those opposed? Sorry, Howard. No chocolate for you. Are we, okay. are we okay with that? All right, so we'll defer this. Go ahead, Lisa. Lisa, we made it. question about how the multiple awards would work, and you're talking about having these multiple groups that come up with their own standards or, or own criteria, so I doubt that you're talking about having funding multiple groups to come up with their own criteria and then having those groups work it out themselves, or are you talking about having different groups for like different disease domains? I think that's going to get presented at May Council. Okay, but perhaps so. talking with council members or something. Sure. Okay. Well, that was informative. Great. It's a hard one. You're right. Uh, so let's move along to uh, Anastasia. 